good afternoon from COP28 Green Zone, uh, the stand of uh, FAB. Uh, very pleased to welcome Mr. Shajil Bashir, Chief Sustainability Officer of FAB Group. Thank you very much. And one of the very few thought leaders uh, in green finance uh, in the MENA region. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at COP28. Uh, the UAE is delivering uh, uh, its promises in terms of being a COP like no other. 30 billion, uh, 1 trillion dirhams, uh, banks and all that. Uh, I asked uh, COP28 about the deployment of uh, those very big funds. They said basically they are not a financial institution, which is obviously the case. How are you planning as a bank to cooperate in terms of deploying uh, uh, this very big money? Uh, let's start with the MENA region. First of all, thank you for having me. So um, on the finance day, we saw the commitment from the UAE banks saying that uh, they will mobilize more than one trillion yes, dirhams, uh, dirhams uh, by 2030. Um, as FAB, we had had a commitment that, uh, which we made two years ago of deploying um, over 275 billion dirhams by 2030. And of this number, in the two years, we have done over 100 billion dirhams already. Mm -hmm. And that's why we uh, yesterday or the day before mm -hmm. announced that we are increasing our commitment mm -hmm. now from the 275 to 500 uh, billion dirhams by 2030 yeah. Yeah. to support the transition that is required. Yeah. The deployment that we've had so far has been focused about 50% of it uh, approximately has been in the UAE mm -hmm. and the remaining part has been in the globally but also in the MENA region rest of it. We're seeing you uh, active in Egypt. Yes, we are active in Egypt. We have also done projects in other DCC countries. Mm -hmm. We have also done pr projects in the more global front uh, as well. Um, and, and this is going to continue for us. There's no limitations for where we're not going to support the transition yeah. as long as it has a link to our home markets. Absolutely. That's a key thing. Um, and as long as it has the link to the markets we operated, we are keen to support the transition. And as we mentioned as well, when we made the announcement, we don't we see this commitment of 500 billion dirhams as a floor, not a ceiling. So it's not that that's the maximum that's we're the gonna start. do. This is for us the, the, the direction we are seeing right now, which we want to work and, and support on. This is gonna come through multiple different kind of projects in renewable energy, uh, new technologies that will support the transition. It's gonna be on the social projects as well. So as an example, as a part of the 100 billion that we have done already, some of it has been related to solar parks, some of it has been related to wind energy, some of it has been related to green buildings. So it's gonna continue wherever the demand yeah. and technology is moving mm -hmm. to support the transition. Yeah. We're seeing you across uh, numerous sectors. We're seeing you in aviation, we're seeing you in rail, we're seeing you in buildings, as you said, uh, energy as well. Uh, what are the top three sectors uh, uh, for you, uh, as you see the most lucrative for you? And what is your position in terms of the uh, industrial ones, the challenging ones, cement uh, and steel? No, so I, I think it's important to remember we're the largest bank in the region. Yes. So we don't say that there are only few sectors we work in. We support clients across the different sectors. So there's not a sector that we rather focus on than the other sectors. Yeah. So, so that will not be fair to say. Uh, we are here to support our clients across the transition. Yeah. And every single sector needs to transition, whether it's transportation, whether it's agriculture, whether it's cement, whether it's steel. We need to support all of these clients yeah. because they're all trying to achieve net zero. Yeah. Uh, how, what is your position? As you know, His Excellency uh, 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 Minister Bentok uh, revealed a very bullish strategy for you to, to be among the world's top food producers. It's a very bullish one. Uh, the small Netherlands basically is the world's uh, uh, number four in terms of uh, uh, food production. So the UAE can, can be. What is FAB positioned within that strategy for food and food security, especially after COVID and all that, and the bullish plans of the UAE government? I think that we as FAB has always shown support and will continue to show support to the leadership of the UAE. UAE made the commitment in October 2021 as a first country to net zero by 2050. In the same month, FAB made the commitment to net zero by 2050 mm -hmm. as well. We see a big connection between the direction the leadership is setting and how we can support. 
And this will go across sectors and across topics. Of course, we have already actively working within the food security chain. We are working with the agriculture mm -hmm. sector as well. And we're going to continue doing that, which is important because that's also a very important sector that needs to transition uh, as well. And we will continue supporting that. So, so we are fully aligned with the direction that the UAE's yeah. leadership is setting on supporting these different sectors on transitioning and supporting them within that. Yeah. We're seeing you across various uh, uh, geographies. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a big market. I would like to ask you about Saudi Arabia and Africa. Why? Because so, we're seeing so many family offices uh, in the UAE and in the Gulf heavily investing in Africa because they see it as the future. Uh, we do know that you have some kind of presence in some African and North African countries. But what is your strategy? for Saudi Arabia and for Africa? I think, again, I, it's not for me to comment on the overall uh, in strategy. In terms of the green finance? What yeah, I mean. the green finance, as I mentioned before, there's no, uh, we don't have a specific geography that we're going to target any more mm -hmm. than anything else. As I said before, transition to net zero applies for all of us. One country, one industry, one company cannot achieve net zero. It's the whole spectrum. This is the end to end. Everybody needs to move in the same direction. Yeah. It's going to be different from industry to industry, how they mature, because some are dependent on technologies that are still very nascent. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very well advanced in those yeah. different technology. So the transition is going to come at different speed. Yeah. Right? And it's going to be different within each country and it's going to be different within each industry. Yeah. Across these, all of them, whether these are the different countries, all different industries, we as FAB, as one of the largest banks in the region, is keen to support that transition happening across these countries and across these sectors. Yeah. Um, basically, you committed to scope one, scope two, scope three by 2050. And this entails also relationships in terms of your partnerships, of your partners in terms of procurement, of everything. Uh, how do you see the acceptance and the adoption of your partners for so, those? And the, uh, what is the connection in this regard and how are you helping them? So let me just correct. So we have made a commitment for scope one and scope two by 2030, mm -hmm. not 2050. And scope, scope three two, by 2050. Scope three by 2050, correct. correct. And the scope three is the category 15, as yes. you know, which is the investment and lending, uh, because that is the biggest emissions from a bank perspective. We don't have production facilities, factories. Trust. So yeah. for us, it is the financed emission that is the key thing. So there we have made a commitment from scope one and two. Uh, we are working on different levers mm -hmm. for year by year. How does our roadmap look like by 2030? How is it that we can um, decarbonize mm -hmm. and achieve this? So that is work in progress. From a scope three perspective, what we did was when we joined the UN Convention Net Zero mm -hmm. Banking mm -hmm. Alliance as the first bank in the region, there we, as part of that uh, framework, we have gone through our portfolio across sectors mm -hmm and understood that our lending, what kind of emission does that create? Mm -hmm. So of that lending specifically, we are now looking through that what are the changes that are specifically required? Mm -hmm. So we announced earlier this year in uh, 2023, targets for three high emitting sectors in our portfolio, mm -hmm. which was oil and gas, aviation, and power. Mm -hmm. And uh, last month in November, we have set targets for additional five sectors. These sectors are agriculture, this is commercial real estate, this is aluminum, steel, and cement. So now these eight sectors totals more than 90% of our financed emissions. So these are the majority part we need to work with. We have engaged with clients within each of these industries to understand their journeys, how does their transition plans look like. They differ, like. basically, they in terms differ. of implementation, big time. Um, and some yes of them no. have major yes challenges no. to adopt that. No, I think uh, basically we've had extremely positive discussions with all of these clients within these industries. All are working, either are started or ha are quite progressed mm -hmm. in their transition plans. Okay. So we engage with all of them to understand where they stand, what does the change look like, work with them. What is very important for me to highlight, and this is something people often um, misunderstand is, our target is not to reduce our lending. Our target is to reduce our emissions. There's mm -hmm. a big difference. Huge. This. Um, because emissions is created every time we do something, there's going to be emissions. Absolutely. And we want to make sure that these emissions get reduced as much mm -hmm. as possible. But in order to reduce these emissions, we need to invest. Mm -hmm. We need to invest in new technologies. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen is a good example, mm -hmm. right? So we need to invest in hydrogen, not only just to focus on reducing emissions, we need to invest so we can reduce emissions as well. 
So that's why we're saying that we are here to support on that decarbonization journey, which again is going to be very different for each of these sectors because they are in different places, uh, they have different maturity, they have different technologies they're depending on, and that's why we are here to support them. Yeah. ESG laws, we do realize that the UAE is developing its laws across the board in terms of E, in terms of S, in terms of J. Uh, we saw the unified laws the, uh, framework announced in Riyadh in January 2023 for the, uh, by the GCC central banks. Uh, Egypt, uh, six plus two, so maybe Egypt and Jordan might join forces. And we have heard that also there are new laws upcoming. Several people, uh, high levels, uh, have, have confirmed. How do you foresee the modernizing process of ESG laws in the Middle East helping banks in this regard? And what is the role of banks in developing those laws? As, as you know, uh, because the governments listen to the private sector, to banks as well. So you have a very solid dialogue in between. I think we have a very good um, dialogue with all the different regulators. Mm -hmm. We have a very strong consultation process in the UAE. So when there is a law as being proposed, they go to consultation mm -hmm. to the to the industry yes. to share their feedback Absolutely. from that perspective. And you and, as, and the, think, as the region's uh, largest bank. Yeah, of course, we, we have a close dialogue with them. But I would say that I have seen very strong commitment coming even from all the ministries. Ministry of Climate Change have engaged with all the sectors mm -hmm. across the board to get inputs, get the direction, mm -hmm. Um, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities when they're developing the different policies? Listen, the role of the policymakers are set the policies. I think that the UE is doing a fantastic job in Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Um, and, and our role is to support those policies and work with them. And, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, I think that the policymakers are doing a fantastic job. I don't have any, any specific yeah. recommendation for them. We are seeing that the policies are coming through on, mm -hmm. on ESG. Mm -hmm. We have seen recently the central bank coming on, um, on the guidelines specifically for climate risk, mm -hmm. which is very, uh, very welcome, mm -hmm. it's very important. Uh, we are very keen to support this. So I, I, I basically think that UAE is just following the trend as how things are developing. The maturity is increasing. We are getting the relevant policies coming through. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we're in a very good place from a yeah. policy perspective. Uh, uh, governors and family offices, as you know, family offices play a major role in the national economy. We saw His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid and see the governance law for family offices in Dubai to uh, for sustainable family operations. Uh, how are you adopting uh, this law with your clients in Dubai? I think it's important to remember that the law because that this has is come through... It's not law for us to adopt. It's a law for our clients to adopt. Yeah, right? but how so, are you helping them financially? No, listen, I think financially. So, so I think honestly, these laws does not require a lot of financing help for the family uh, offices. I think they're already very well matured mm -hmm. to to uh, to take the action that are mm -hmm. required. We are here as their financial partner to support them in that specific things. But uh, implementing these laws does not necessarily require the bank's help itself. I think they're very well positioned already themselves to do so. All right. Okay. Uh, we have to talk about Islamic finance. Uh, it's a big debate. Uh, some people say that they, it might have a major role in the transition. Some saying less so. How do you position uh, you as a, a FAB bank in this regard? It's, and including Sukuk, you know that you have had so many Sukuk. It's a huge uh, uh, $2 trillion market. Uh, a big chunk of it remains untapped. Uh, I do know that, I realize that you are at the forefront in this regard in the region. Again, how do you foresee the future uh, in this regard as a big chunk of it remains untapped? Listen, I think that all financial instruments are going to play a huge role when we're going to make a transition to net zero. And Islamic finance is going to be one of them, just like many other financial instruments are going to be extremely important. So um, I welcome all the direction that has begun. We have been active in the Islamic market as well. And uh, I, I foresee that we will continue being so as well. Um, so I don't see any, I don't see it's a, it's a discussion between conventional versus Islamic. They need to go hand in hand. And every type of financing, by the way, needs to go hand in hand in, in transitioning. As I said before, just like not one country, not one industry or one Complete company. Complete inclusion. The same, yeah, the, the topic is inclusion of everyone to move in that direction. Whether it's conventional financing, Islamic financing, we need support from all financial instruments to make that transition.
ESG literacy. We as the first and only ESG knowledge hub in the region throughout our first year of existence after COP27 have, have seen and witnessed a big gap in this regard, scarcity in ESG literacy. You personally, as a thought leader in this regard, you come at the forefront and also representing FAB. How can we develop ESG literacy uh, in, the, uh, in the sector? I think, uh, listen, I think a lot of good stuff is happening on this topic. We've just seen the launch of the um, Global uh, Sustainable Finance Hub that was announced recently uh, by the presidency of COP28. I think so much good stuff has been taken. I think that the financial industry has taken the role of supporting this. We saw this with financial literacy that was raised by the banks as well. Similarly, I'm seeing the ESG literacy increasing as well. Uh, from, a, from a financial industry perspective. And I think that's positive. That's a role we have to play as an industry to support that transition. I'm seeing a lot of good information coming from, from our bank, from the industry itself. We are seeing more collaboration happening with the different institutions, whether these are universities, curriculums that are being developed linked to ESG. From our perspective, we want to support the, uh, the, the understanding, raising awareness, whether it goes from the classroom to the boardroom, mm -hmm. we need to raise awareness on ESG across all these uh, mm -hmm. different um, phases, mm -hmm. so to say. Um, and that's important for us, and we are, we are keen to play an important role in this. So you remain very positive uh, for the, in the foreseeable absolutely, future? Absolutely. There's, not, there's no transition to net zero without raising the awareness and, and making it part of um, What is your plan at FAB in this regard? So as, as FAB, we have done a lot already. So uh, as an example, we started internally. Uh, last year, we had more than 10,000 hours of ESG training to our employees. 10,000 hours, That's just to huge. highlight this. Um, all employees and FAB has had mandatory ESG training. Every single employee have gone through it mm -hmm. from end to end. Um, on top of this, what we also done this year is we developed a, in a collaboration with the IMD uh, University in Switzerland, a program called Frontiers in Sustainability, uh, where we have sponsored a executive education on sustainability. Online the or in person? No, in person. Uh, 12 days for the two cohorts we run, where we had over 30 leaders, future leaders in the UAE mm -hmm. that came together to give them, which are not sustainability experts, mm -hmm. by the way. These are people from financing, operations, other strategy mm -hmm. people to say why is sustainability going to be so important in their future decision making. Yeah. So again, as I said, we are moving from the classroom to the boardroom. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we can raise awareness across these parts. So we are working on this internally, but also externally. If you had visited our pavilion yesterday here in the green zone, we had 200 kids from the different schools coming and doing workshops on understanding the importance of a nature mm -hmm. specifically, which was a topic that was in focus yesterday. We're expecting 200 kids to come here on the last day of COP on the 12th as well, where we have invited 200 kids to come and doing the workshop in our pavilion to understand this as well. So we are literally going through different levels wherever we can contribute and support on this. So yeah, so that's what are the tangible actions from our side. Great efforts indeed. Uh, and last question, uh, we are at COP28 uh, in the coming uh, one year. Uh, what are your main, uh, basically, goals or, yeah, goals, let's say. Or so, what, what, what would you like to see in the coming 12 uh, months happening uh, from, in terms of green finance in the region? Yeah, I think I will, I will take the different approach. For us, our goals does not change. This is a long-term ambition we need to do. When we went to COP26, when we went to COP27, coming to COP28, we've had the same six-point agenda that we are going to continue working on. Um, and that's going to continue towards COP29, no. COP30. And this is scaling sustainable finance. Yeah. It is transition to net zero, where we need to support the industries. It's raising awareness for SMEs. Mm -hmm. It's supporting the carbon markets. Mm -hmm. It's impacting the social aspect, which is raising awareness, as you mentioned, the, the youth. And the final part is nature. Yeah. So these six priorities yeah. does not change for us. Yeah. These are important for us. Within each one of them, we are progressing differently. We are setting different targets, ambitions on those, and that change. But our agenda for each cup does not change. That is what is giving us consistency. This is how we can support our stakeholders, our clients, our partners, 
on the topic of climate change and sustainability. Yeah. Uh, do you see cooperation, uh, further cooperation between the different banks in, GC in the GCC for ESG, advancing ESG? Any special plan, any special initiative that you recommend? No, I think, listen, uh, I think we as banks, we collaborate a lot across. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have UBF, UA Bank Federation. Yes, uh, but we are seeing the implementation of ESG and the activity differ between banks. Of course, and, and you see this globally as well. This Absolutely. Is not, uh, UA is not different than the global parties. Um, you know, just like everything, some launch products earlier than others does. It depends on your strategy. It depends on your business model, how those work specifically. Um, so, so listen, we work very closely with the other banks as well. Uh, UAE Bank Federation is supporting with the direction and facilitating that dialogue, convening as well. And as I said, I work very closely. We're here in Climate Finance Hub. I have visited all the stands here of our peers. I believe all our peers have visited our stand as well. So it's important to work together, absolutely. learn from each other. Knowledge sharing? To, absolutely, it's critical. Critical. Sharjil, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you thank so much you. for having me. Thank you.